All right, we're going to be going over, uh, for the next two weeks, we're going to be going over the story of Gideon. Um, and yes, that does mean you're stuck with me for the next two weeks. So, you know, my apologies. But <laughs> um, and we're going to start off in Judges chapter 6, because uh, that is actually where Gideon's story begins. Um, and I'm probably going to take a little bit of a different perspective uh, of the story of Gideon than what you've heard. Um, I'm going to do my best to actually go through the scriptures in a way that's a little bit different from how you've heard me preach previously. Uh, usually when I preach, it's a little bit more exhortation, kind of a prophetic lens and sort of going at things that way. Um, what we're endeavoring to do with this series is take things a little bit more line by line. Um, for those of you who understand what the word exegesis is, we're trying to do that a little bit more closely. Uh, we want to actually take you guys through the scripture um, and get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of stuff and rather than just giving you an overarching view of generally what things mean. So it's going to be a little bit of a change of pace, but it's going to be really, really good. I promise. Uh, for those of you who are my fellow Bible nerds, you can just wave at me. Just me? All two of us. Got it. Um, you're going to enjoy this because we're going to start to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of stuff and it's going to be really good. Um, and I want to start off kind of by setting some context here, and we're going to look at this in the beginning of Judges chapter 6. Most of us read the story of Gideon, and we think through, like, you know, is Gideon, we, we tend to summarize it down to, is Gideon's story permission for me to give God tests uh, so that I can choose to obey him or not? If we're, if we're going to, like, if we're going to be really honest with ourselves, that tends to be the part that we remember the fleeces, and that tends to be the part that we try to actually apply to our lives. It's like, ah, this guy named Gideon did it. Uh, God, I need you to do this, that, and the other thing, and then I'll really know that you're talking to me, and then we can go forward and do that. Uh, there is much more depth to Gideon's story. There's much more going on here, and that's what we're going to get into. So I'm going to be reading a bunch of scripture to us today. Again, that's probably a good thing to do in church. Uh, in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years, and they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites uh, made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and the people of the east came and attacked them. They encamped against them and destroyed the produce of the land, even as far as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey, for the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. They and their camels were without number. And they entered the land to lay waste to it. So Israel became poverty-stricken because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. Verse 7, when the Israelites cried out to him because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to them. He said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt and out of the place of slavery. I rescued, rescued you from the power of Egypt and the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you live in, but you did not obey me. So as we enter into chapter 6, we get to see the pattern that we've been discussing these past couple of weeks as we've been going through Judges. God raises up a deliverer, they have peace for a while, and then they fall back into their same cycle. It's this deliverer, sin, rebellion, they get oppressed, they cry out, God raises up a deliverer, and we keep seeing the cycle. And what we see here at the beginning of chapter 6 um, we really get an insight into the heart of the people of God. We see that when they cry out to the Lord, Scripture says they cried out to the Lord because of Midian. They were under oppression from these other nations, and that was the reason they cried out, which gives us this insight that they're not crying out because they realize that they've messed up. They're crying out because they're tired of being in pain. Not to say that that's not good or that that's not also valid, but we're getting an insight, again, into the hearts of the people. And as we go through the rest of the story of Gideon, we'll continue to see this theme that they're crying out, and they're sort of cooperating with the Lord, but really they haven't gotten it through their heads and into their hearts that the reason you're here is because of the choices that you've made. And for some of you, this might seem a little harsh, but if you're coming from, again, this Hebrew perspective, having this understanding of the law, having this understanding of the covenant that God made with his people. Um, for those of you who like extra reading, I'm talking about Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Uh, 
that's where God highlights the covenant that he made with Israel. And he gives very specific, very specific blessings and curses that come with the covenant. If you follow the Lord, if you honor him, if you keep his commandments, these are the things that are going to happen for you. This is the blessing that's going to follow you. If after entering this covenant, a choice that they made, if after entering this covenant, you choose not to follow the Lord, these are the things that are going to happen to you. So that's why even God sends prophets. Prophets do more than just have encounters, get revelation, um, and share encouraging words with you. Part of what prophets do, if we look again through the entire length of scripture, part of what prophets do is they call the people of God back into account for the covenant that they made with God. So the prophet comes in and he says, look, this is the oppression that's happening. This is why it's happening. This is happening because you entered into a covenant with God and you willingly chose to go against what he said Therefore, these are the consequences for the choices that you've made. And again, something that really, can I share something that really bothers me about the Old Testament, or I should say what people say about the Old Testament? The, what seems to be the default thing that most Christians say when they see something in the Old Testament that they don't like, is they say, oh, that was an Old Covenant. And they leave it at that. Can I just be totally honest and say that is, I, I understand that there are things in scripture that will make us uncomfortable. If it makes you uncomfortable, good. That means you're, you're, you've got air in your lungs. You're not brain dead, like you're paying attention. But can I say that just schluffing it off under this excuse of it was an old covenant is an extremely lazy way to read scripture. That's not to say that there isn't truth to the dynamic of we're in a new covenant and scripture tells us it's a better covenant. But let me tell you something about the Old Testament. Even if something that happens is the result of them being under a different covenant than we are, the one thing that does not change is the character of God. What the Old Testament gives us a glimpse into is we have all these other books, a glimpse into the character of a good God. Yes. We talk about grace. Yes, God is graceful. Yes, God, he's, he's merciful. And I want to sort of come at this from another perspective. Those of you who are parents or who are grandparents, how many of you understand that when you tell your child what the consequences will be for their actions, you then have to follow through. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're actually not setting your child up for success living in this world. And you actually make yourself out to be a liar if you don't follow through with the consequences that you said would happen. We might think, God, you should have just given them more grace. You should have just extended stuff out. Number one, God always gives, throughout scripture in the Old Testament, we see this, he gives generations worth of grace. Yes. The, the, the narrative moves along really quickly, but we're always talking minimum of like 40, 80, 120 plus years between when they start veering off of the course and when God finally actually says, okay, we're done. Yeah. That's number one. Number two if God did not enact the consequences that he laid out for the covenant, we would not be able to call him faithful. We would not be able to call him faithful. We would not be able to call him a God who keeps his word. But as we'll see, as we go through the rest of the story of Gideon, the prophet gives this message. He says, hey, this is where you messed up. At the same time, God's working something else in the background. Starting in verse 11. The angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abusrite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior. 
the goodness of God is that even while he's disciplining his children, he's simultaneously working their redemption. Even while he's rebuking the children of Israel and saying, this is why you're here, he's simultaneously appearing to this guy threshing wheat in a wine press. And the rest of the story, as we'll talk about here, is this is the man that God's chosen to actually redeem Israel. Even while he's disciplining, he's raising them back up. Even while he's rebuking, he's creating a way out. And there's something, again, I see, what I see so much throughout this chapter, throughout the story of Gideon, is that really the, the people of God have begun to doubt the character of God. We're going to see this through the whole chapter. And even with that, we see so much irony throughout Gideon's call. Um, and, and even in how the Lord's relating to people. Gideon's threshing wheat in a wine press. Obviously, just following basic English, that doesn't make sense. You wouldn't thresh wheat in a place where you're supposed to be pressing wine. Like, that makes sense to us. But as you start to get down into even a little bit of, again, told you I'm a Bible nerd. This is what you get. You're getting some of my overly expensive education for free, so you're welcome. <laughs> um, the, the way that uh, wine presses were built Again, they were up on a hillside. They kind of used gravity, so there were these two tiers to them. So there was an upper tier where people would actually be stepping on and crushing grapes, and then the juice would flow down into the bottom tier. They'd be able to collect it and then store it and ferment it and make wine. So what Gideon's probably doing here is he's in probably this lower level, and the way that you would thresh wheat, um, I know a couple of you are probably farmers in here, but for those of us who didn't grow up in that, the way you thresh wheat is you have to separate the wheat from the chaff, right? You have to separate the part that's usable from the part that's not. So the way that you would do that is you'd actually gather the wheat and you'd be throwing it up into the air. So you're kind of causing this abrasion, causing things to separate, and you need the wind to catch the chaff and then blow things away. That doesn't work too well when you're up on the side of a mountain and there's barriers, so we're seeing, okay, so Gideon's obviously afraid. I mean, the, the passage tells us that much. But we're really starting to get an idea of, like, this is the level of desperation. Um, passages previously told us that Israel was actually made poor because of the level of oppression that they were under. Any time that crops were coming back up, their enemies were coming through and wiping them out. So he's actually to the point of, if I don't do this this way, I probably don't get to eat. My family probably doesn't get to eat. And this is just an interesting note um, that I felt the Lord was just highlighting to me. Um, one of the ways that you can start to understand if you're under oppression in an area of your life is you're doing something in a way that just makes absolutely no sense. To put it another way, one of the ways that you know that there might be oppression in an area of your life is if your response does not match the magnitude of what's going on. This is, again, I take tangents all the time. This is one of them. So this is just food for thought. Um, for, for those of us, for, for people who grew up in, an, in a home environment that did not feel safe, when you live under that kind of oppression, everything that you do is in light of that. You, you think a certain way, you do chores a certain way, you talk to people a certain way because you're fearing the response of the people in the home. So when that actually follows you out, you start to interact with people and people are like, that's kind of an odd way to do that. Um, for a lot of us, those of you who've been married, you kind of start to see this when you come together. You're like, your spouse is looking at you and is like, hey, that might not, that's kind of not a normal way to to do that. And you're like, what? I thought everybody, no. Nope. Something to think about. Again, totally off the beaten path. Something that I saw that I thought might be useful. <laughs> Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if, if the Lord is with us, this is in verse 13, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. Mm 
here's where we start to get, again, into some more irony. Number one, the, the guy who's threshing wheat in the wine press scared for his life, he's the one that the Lord comes to and calls him valiant warrior. And that phrase actually in Hebrew is only used in a few different instances. One of them, it's actually used to describe David's mighty men. So this is more than just, okay, somebody who knows how to fight. This is somebody who's got an extra level of courage, an extra level of specialization. God sees this man in a wine press and identifies him as that. God sees him in a wine press and identifies him as that man. And furthermore, Gideon then comes and says, okay, look, if, if what you're saying is true, if the Lord's actually with us, then what about all these stories that I've heard? So we're getting a clue that to some extent, Gideon's been raised the way he was supposed to according to the law. Like his parents were telling him the stories that he was supposed to hear. Uh, he was getting that history. And again, this is sort of a clue to the issues that Israel was having. It wasn't that... They completely abandoned the Hebrew faith. It wasn't that they completely abandoned Yahweh. It's that they wanted Yahweh and. They wanted Yahweh and something else. And this is where we talk about the jealousy of God. How many of you have heard that term before? This is where that comes from. It's, It's not that God's this greedy person who needs more. It's that he will not tolerate other lovers in your life. And let me point out even further, that's actually to our benefit. (laughs) Because when we tolerate those other things, we bring the type of curses and destruction into our lives that God talks about. (sighs) And then even in Gideon's response, I told you this is filled with irony. Gideon in his disobedience and in Israel's disobedience didn't recognize that the person talking to him was the one who he said had abandoned him. The the angel of the Lord in scripture, that's a phrase that actually represents what, again, fancy theology term, a theophany. It's an appearance of God in human form prior to Jesus. Uh, We can get that from context. We see that even as, I'll read through the rest of the passage, the way that he's responding, he's responding as the Lord. Um, The the way that the phrase breaks down in Hebrew, melech Yahweh, Um, is different than how angels are referred to in Hebrew, where normally that would be Elohim. Um, So this this is God appearing to him. And again, Gideon, because of where he's at, can't even recognize fully the person who's talking to him. He's saying, you've abandoned me, and he doesn't realize the irony of the God who I'm saying has abandoned me is right here in front of me. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian I'm sending you. What I so love about God's response in this moment, and he does it all throughout the rest of this passage, what I love about his response is that Gideon throws up all these objections, he throws up all these insecurities. God, for the most part, doesn't acknowledge them and just keeps moving on with the conversation. Just like, that's nice. You're going to go and you're going to deliver Israel from the hands of Midian. And here's one thing that, again, if I could really drive a few points home, this is one thing I want you guys to take away. Our insecurities and our excuses really don't matter to God. Now, that's both a blessing and an indictment, okay? That's a blessing because, number one, God recognizes that you, you are not significant enough to be able to screw everything up. As much as you feel, as much as you feel that your insecurities, your mess-ups, your failures present this massive obstacle to God using you, he's like, that's cute. Anyway, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> But here's the indictment side of that, or I should say the caution. Indictment might be a little bit of a strong word. That means that if we allow those things to get in the way of us being obedient to what God's asked us to do, if we allow those things to get in the way of us moving in the gifts and the graces that God's given us, it's us choosing that. 
and let me point out, Israel consistently making that choice is what has them in this position. A lot of the theme of what's happening through the book of Judges is we have previous generations choosing the extent to which they'll half-heartedly follow God at the expense of the generations that come after them. Here's how that starts to play out in our day. We have gifts, we have callings, we have things that the Lord is asking us to do. And we say no to them. We bury the talents that he's given us to reference that parable that Jesus told. Not only at the expense of our being obedient to what he's asked us to do, but at the expense of the people that God's trying to reach through us being obedient. We good? This is a little heavy, but it's good, I promise. This is <laughs> part, part of why I'm harping on this and getting at this is I, I just believe that the Rock of Roseville is entering into a season where we collectively as a whole start to understand that the people who come up here and speak or do things on this stage, we are like the less than 10% of the ministry that's supposed to be happening. And part of that happens when you realize that God is not actually looking for you to be perfect in your gifting. He just wants you to step out and start and he'll help you clean up the messes along the way. He's put you in a body of people who will help you clean up the messes along the way. And again, your insecurity, your reasons for why, our reasons, I'm not trying to put this on you, I do this too, our reasons for why, God, we can't do that because I failed in the past here, I didn't see you show up there, I don't know if I can pray for healing for this person because I have a friend who passed away from cancer and you didn't, like, all of that, as real as the pain is, as real as the confusion is, not an excuse in the kingdom. Going back to verse 15, he said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my mother's family. The angel of the Lord responds, but I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will take Midian as if it were one man. Then he said to him, I have found favor. if I have found favor with you, give me a sign that you are speaking with me. Please do not leave this place until I return to you. Let me bring my gift and set it before you. I'm going to go through a bigger chunk of scripture here. And he said, I will stay until you return. So Gideon went and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from a half bushel of flour. He placed the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat with the unleavened bread, put it on the stone and pour the broth on it. So he did that. The angel of the Lord extended the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire came up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon realized... Uh, that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Oh no, Lord God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace to you. Don't be afraid, for you will not die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. It is still an Ophrah of the Abizrites to this day. Jehovah Shalom, I heard somebody say that, yep. Um, again, all throughout this passage, we see... The issue, really, when it comes down to it, is Gideon doesn't know if he can trust God. Even in the way that he's explaining to God his understanding of events, he's saying to the Lord, like, okay, but where are all the miracles that you said have happened? And then even after he realizes that at some point he gets a sense that he's talking to, if not God himself, an angel, he says, okay, but let me give you these tests. It points to a reality in his heart that he doesn't actually know if God can be trusted. It's not a question of whether or not he believes he's hearing him correctly. It's not a question of whether or not God believes he's made the right choice. It's a question of whether or not I think I can trust God to do what he's telling me he's going to do. And again, that even betrays, I'm going to be hitting a lot of these same points because, again, I think the authors are trying to hit some of these points home for us, the people who wrote the story down. 
even the way that Gideon is explaining his understanding of all of this still shows that he hasn't gotten it in his own heart that the reason we're here is not because God doesn't do what he said he was going to do. The reason we're in this place is because we chose to do something different than what God asked us to do. The way he's relating to God is saying, okay, but you've abandoned us and you've handed us over to Midian. And what's glaringly absent from his explanation is, and this is because we chose not to follow you. So everything that all of this dialogue is pointing to is that Gideon, even as the deliverer that God's choosing, still has doubts on whether or not God is actually trustworthy. But what is absolutely beautiful in this story is God's response of patience to us. You'll see it here. You'll see it when we go through the fleeces here in a little bit. But God actually never gets angry with Gideon for all the tests that he puts him through. Which points to a few things. Number one, again, God is incredibly patient. We want to speak of his character. He reveals he is so patient with us. He has every right, every right to demand, no, you don't actually get to stipulate terms of an agreement here. You know who I am and what I'm asking of you. You need to go do it. He has every right to ask that of us. He has every right to ask that of Gideon. But he's patient. He sees what's going on in Gideon's heart and he says, number one, I'm going to be patient with you. And number two, I'm more concerned about what's going to happen to the whole of my people rather than forcing something right now. The other theme, again, We'll talk about it throughout this whole series. The other theme in Judges is even though God raises up human deliverers that partner with him, we really get the picture very clearly. It's God is the one who's doing the delivering. And even we start to, we get, again, Bible nerd stuff. We get this picture of how much Gideon recognizes to some extent who he's talking to by the nature of the sacrifice that he pulls up. And I'm, I'm only going to harp on this because what I want to help start to teach our body to do is notice things in scripture. Like so many times we're speed reading through stuff and there are times where that's okay. Like there's times where volume is really good, but there's things that you catch when you slow down. So again, he, he's talking to one guy. Gideon's talking to one guy. But for some reason, when he goes and prepares a meal, he gets a whole goat, an ephah of flour, which is equivalent to a little over two liters, and a whole pot of broth. That's a whole lot of food for just two people to be eating. Whole lot of food for just two people to be eating. And also, this again points to the patience of the Lord because Gideon had to go to his flock, he had to pick out a goat, he had to slaughter the goat, he had to cook the whole goat, he had to get two liters of flour, prepare them into cakes, cook them, make broth, and then come back. This wasn't Gideon going, let me go grab something from my fridge and give it to you. This is a whole deal. And number one, or I should say number two, again, this is so much more than two people can eat, which tells us Again, just based on some things we know of how worship and sacrifice looked in that day and age, Gideon has some sort of an idea that he's talking to a divine being here. He's getting all of this food together. It looks very similar. If you read through the Old Testament, it looks very similar to other sacrifices that get offered. He's putting all of this in front of him. And then what kind of drives the point home for Gideon is the way that the sacrifice gets consumed. The guy takes the end of his staff, puts it on it, Fire goes up, he disappears, Gideon goes, oh, that's who I've been talking to. But even, again, so much of this just reveals the heart of what's going on in Gideon because he's been talking to the Lord this whole time. He's had some idea that that's been going on and he hasn't passed away, but now all of a sudden that the angel of the Lord disappears from his sight. He's like, woe is me. I've seen seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And he's giving that response because there's this tradition and it talks about even in, um, in Deuteronomy and Exodus that no man can see God and live. So he's coming from that place, but again, he, at some level, he's misunderstanding the nature and the character of God because 
if that were true, it would have already happened, right? He's been having this whole conversation with him. And now all of a sudden he's like, oh, woe is me. It, it betrays in his heart. He's got this fundamental understanding of who the Lord is as this punitive, fickle God, which again, he, he's used to seeing at this point. It also kind of shows how much his heart and his mind have been formed by the worship of other gods. Because if you read through, I mean, most of us would be somewhat familiar with Greek mythology. Um, it, it's the same the whole way through, just different faces, different demons, it, but it's the same the whole way through. These other gods are these fickle creatures who are, rather than being above humanity, they're more like humanity on steroids. There's divorce, there's all this other gross stuff that happens, there's fighting, there's killing, all of this. And, and we even get this glimpse that somehow Gideon's idea of who God is is being shaped by that, by the way he's responding to the fact that he's just seen God. <clears throat> As a side note, maybe not much of a side note, we do this with God all the time. And there's, again, it's not that there's not validity to it, but it's something we have to be aware of in our own hearts. Our understanding of God oftentimes becomes more shaped by the culture around us, by the things that have happened to us, rather than allowing God to tell us what he's like. The easiest one to see this with is calling God Father. I forget, oh, it's such a good quote, and I remember it, but I forget who said it. Um, we spend years of our lives trying to wipe the face of our fathers off of the face of God. Yeah. And again, it's not that that struggle isn't real, it's not that it's not valid, it's not that God isn't in it, but it tells us that so often we come with our assumptions about who the Father actually is and what he's like, and we allow that to determine our interaction with him rather than going, look, these are fears, these are insecurities that I have. What do you say about who you are? What does your word actually say about who you are? There's a phrase that kind of runs around in uh, different circles that many of us are a part of where it says, I, allow, I don't allow my experience to determine what scripture says. I have to fight through until my experience matches the level of what scripture says. I'm kind of butchering that, but I get the point across. And many times we use that strictly in the sense of talking about miracles, the miraculous faith, and that's good. I want to encourage us to do that same thing, but with intimacy with God. Amen. Scripture talks about, again, this is a tangent, but I, I want to go there with us today. Um, scripture tells us about this guy named Enoch who walked so closely with God that, uh, again, the picture that Scripture is giving us is that this man walked so closely with God and God so wanted to be with him that God was like, I, I just need to take you early. And it says that Enoch was, the Hebrew is really weird. It's like Enoch was walking with God and then he was, and all of a sudden he was not. It, it's this image, not that he passed away, but that God literally was like, I just, I need you with me. There's levels of intimacy, guys, that we have yet to breach with the Lord. What if a whole company of people went there together? What if a whole group of people actually trusted the Father when he said he was going to do something? That is, again got so much to say today, but that's one of the other things that God's really pointing out here is like, you, you guys don't actually believe I am who I say I am. That's what the story of Gideon is about. That's why he goes back and tests him so many times. Moving through with the story, I have to remember we're taking communion today. Stay on track, Aaron. On that very night, the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull and a second bull seven years old. Then tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Build a well-constructed altar to the Lord your God on the top of his mound. Take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his male servants and did as the Lord told him, but because he was too afraid of his father's family and the men of the city to do it in the daytime, he did it at night. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through uh, the rest of it line by line. But I definitely want to at least hit this before 
we move on um, and go through communion here today. Um, you guys ever realize that like God is not above making an example of the enemy? <laughs> we, we like to, again, we talk about a God who's gracious, who's merciful, who's loving, and that's all true. We also serve a jealous God who is not above making an example of the people who would take advantage of his children. Let me break this down for you a little bit. One of the symbols that Baal is consistently represented as throughout history is a bull. Okay, some of you, I see the wheels turning. You're good. We're on the right track. Is a bull. And then his consort, again, these, like Baal and Asher were worshipped together most of the time, um, just in the way that ancient Near Eastern religions worked. His consort was Asherah. So it's just a little bit beyond God telling Gideon, hey, you need to tear this down. He gave really specific instructions. Take this animal that your people recognize as a symbol of Baal. Use it to tear down the altar of Baal. Build an altar to the Lord on top of its ruins. And then use the wood from the Asherah tree as fuel for the sacrifice to Yahweh. <laughs> He's got, God's got a little bit of gangster in him. Like, got it. Like, he's, he is not above making an example of his enemies. And gosh, this, again, if, if the Old Testament reveals something to us about the character of God, even if we're in different covenants, it reveals this. God not only hates what the enemy is doing to his people, he is out to outright humiliate the enemy for what he's done to his people. And the scripture even talks about this in the New Testament. It says that, uh, God, through Jesus, was making a spectacle of the principalities and powers. I love talking about this, so I'm going to go there. Uh, he made a spectacle of the principalities and powers. That Greek word talks about this practice that was common in those days where, uh, again, in like Greek context, so more around Jesus' time, where a conquering king would take the other kings or generals that he had just beaten, put a ring through their nose, get his finger through that ring and drag them through the streets in a procession. That is what Paul is saying Jesus did to the principalities and powers in Jesus. And again, we're, so much of what happens in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do completely in the new. So even as we're seeing God humiliate these other gods uh, in how he's having Gideon tear down the altars, we see this thing completed in Jesus. It's not just these local deities, these local demons that Israel has been having issues with. When we move forward to the New Testament, Jesus says everything, everything that would exalt itself above God, every demon that would try to oppress my people, everything that people have been worshipped, have worshipped that is not me, I'm not just going to throw them off the altar. I'm going to humiliate them so that they know they've been beaten. And then just one last thing, uh, and we'll transition here. Uh, this is the benefit of you having me for two weeks. I can pick up where I left off next week. As you go through the rest of the story, uh, Gideon, even though we're like, eh, you were a little bit of a coward because you did it at night, we see that he had you know, reason to be afraid because as soon as everybody in the town wakes up and sees what's going on, they're like, oh, this person needs to die. So they go through, they make a thorough investigation, they figure out Gideon's the one who did it. They come to his dad. Gideon was still living in his father's house at the time. Very normal for that society. He says, hey, uh, you need to give us your son because he tore this altar down and he needs to die for it. And Gideon's father's response is basically, oh, so Baal needs your help. <laughs> and then that's where Gideon gets his other name that scripture refers to him as Jerubbabel, which means let Baal contend with him, which I hadn't thought about this. Um, and I'm going to take a second to say this little factoid is one of the reasons why studying scripture alongside with like good commentaries can be really beneficial. Um, it's not strictly necessary, but as you're wanting to dive deep, this is the type of stuff that you get to find out. Um, it pointed out that after Gideon gets called Jerubbabel, let Baal contend with him, every day that he exists alive on the earth from there on out is proof of Baal's impotence. Every single day 
that let Baal contend with him exists on the earth, isn't punished, doesn't die, is proof that this God that they've worshipped really doesn't have the power that they think he does. It's beautiful. I love it. Um, We're going to take communion. It's a little bit of a harsh transition, but we're going to do it. Um, So I believe, yeah, ushers, if you could start uh, passing out the elements. Um, There's a portion of scripture that I didn't get to today, um, but we will next week, where after these events, it talks about that the Spirit of God covered Gideon and the, the verbiage there in the Hebrew is a little bit more strong than the normal, like he came upon somebody. It's that literally Gideon wore God like a cloak. And it's from that place, that level of empowerment that Gideon actually, as we'll see later, Gideon actually calls all of Israel together. It's that divine empowerment. It's that God coming on him for a task that actually empowers him to do what God has set him aside to do. And I'm wanting to bring this up today because I think so many times we, we just go through the motions with communion and, and we miss the, the beauty and the power of what's actually happening here. Thank you, brother. Even in the word, communion. Communion. The, the, the beauty of what God did in Jesus isn't just the victory that I was talking about. It isn't just the putting the enemies of God underneath our feet. It gets even deeper to some of the things I've been talking about with this story. It's, you want to see my character? Look at my son. Hebrews talks about how Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. To put that in modern day language, again, it's if you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. And again, we get even more of a clue into what the Father actually desires because, again, it would be, it would be one thing if the only thing that the cross accomplished was freedom from sin and putting enemies underneath our feet, though that's true. But the gospel doesn't actually stop there. Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, it's actually better for you that I go so that my Father can send the Helper, the Holy Spirit. And even while he's in his earthly ministry, Jesus talks about how we're going to be one with him even as he and the Father are one. I mentioned earlier how the Old Testament kind of foreshadows these things that are brought to completion in the new. And one of the things, again, we see throughout the Old Testament, we see in the life of Gideon is God, the Spirit of God comes upon a person for a certain amount of time to accomplish a specific task. But in Jesus, the Spirit of God doesn't just come on you, He lives in you. And the beauty of that is it's more than just you have somebody with you. It's that that God is actually changing you at a core level. 1 Corinthians talks about that those who are with God have been made one spirit with him. That means that you at your core level, if you love and follow Jesus, have actually been fused to this level of oneness with God. And that's even why we call this communion. It's People differ on this thing theologically, but the way that scripture talks about the bread and the cup and even how Jesus talks about it. This is, there's something more going on here than something that's purely symbolic. In our obedience to Jesus to take the bread and to take the cup, we actually, again, the church talks about mystery, right? We don't know how to fully define this, but in our obedience with this and even in how we talk about Jesus, like we're actually united to him. God says, you have questions about my character. How about I become one with you and you can actually begin to feel what I feel, see what I see, hear what I hear.
you have questions on if I'm going to fulfill my promise to come back, how about I put a down, posit of my, a, a down payment, a deposit of myself inside of you? One more thing. Again, I could clearly talking is uh, something I'm gifted at. Like I'm, I'm usually not at a loss for words, so I'm going to have to cut myself off here. But one of the other things that's beautiful, um, and I think we miss a lot in our more Western context because we're super individualistic. Communion is not just about communion with God; it's about communion with each other. It's not just about me being in union with God. It's about all of us together in union with God. Scripture talks about how the the end goal of what God's trying to do in Jesus is everything, everything in heaven and on earth is going to be summed up underneath him. So part of what we're doing in taking communion is this is an engagement with Jesus now. It's celebrating our union with him now and it's also looking forward prophetically to when everything that's been in the way of communion, every family argument, every time you were betrayed, every time somebody backstabbed you, every time you fell short and you violated relationship, there's coming a day where that's all gonna be completely wiped away and we're gonna be standing next to each other looking at Jesus saying he did what he said he was gonna do. He did what he said he was going to do. So I want you to just grab the the elements here and I'm going to pray and lead us through. Jesus, we thank you for the body that you broke, your body that you allowed to be broken. Your word says that by your stripes we're healed, God, that there's something in the way that you offered up your body that actually paid the way for our redemption, that paid the way for our healing. So Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us as we take the bread. Jesus, we thank you for the cup. We thank you for your blood that was shed. God, we thank you that your blood is what sealed a better covenant for us. We thank you that your blood is what washes away sin. Your blood is what brings us back into communion with the Father. And again, even more than back into communion with you, it brings us into oneness with you. So, Father, we thank you for your shed blood. We thank you for who you are, for what you're doing in this community. We thank you for a perfect picture of your character. We love you, God. We can take the cup. So Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you that you are who you say you are. God, we thank you that you're patient with us in the middle of us not knowing if we can trust you. We thank you that you made a way for us to come up higher. You made a way for us to come up above all of that. In Jesus' name.